The UN estimates that by 2050 there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. It's estimated that 100 million tons of plastic are generated globally each year. Local authorities have been forced to close beaches due to mounds of plastic rubbish. Hello, I'm Tammy Vendange, an executive turned social entrepreneur. It's clear that Mother Nature has a plastics problem, but I think it's time to quit talking about the problem. Instead, let's talk about the solutions. This is a business podcast with an environmental mission. And as your host of the Plastics Revolution, I'm going to chat with the innovators, change makers, and fellow entrepreneurs who are leading the way in fighting plastic waste. Along the way, we'll also share tips and practical ideas so that you too can be part of the solution. This is the Plastics Revolution. In this episode of Plastics Revolution, I chat with Nev Hyman of Nev House. Nev started his career shaping surfboards for the world's best surfers. Along the way, he even sold a company to famous professional surfer, Kelly Slater. So how did the surfboard maker get into building homes from recycled plastic? That's exactly what we talk about in this show, as well as his future plans. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Plastics Revolution with Nev Hyman of Nev House. Nev, welcome to the show. My pleasure. <laughs> I first read about your company's flat pack homes that you make out of recycled plastic. And before we dive deep into that... I actually want to know more about how did you get involved in the surf world? Uh, yeah. As a very young man, um, I uh, was a young surfer in Western Australia at about eight or nine years old, um, heavily involved in the ocean with my family, living in Perth and going down to Margaret River, the beautiful region in Western Australia. And um, one day I saw my brother-in-law's uh, surfboard in my dad's garage and I went, I want to do that. So I ended up um, getting a surfboard for Christmas and uh, began surfing. And then by the time I was 13, I was making surfboards as a hobby. And then I be uh, became a, a bit of an entrepreneur because I was making surfboards at school up until year 12. And the day that we finished year 12, I opened a surfboard business with my buddies um, and really have never had a real job. I've actually never worked for anybody else except for myself. So I guess I'm the classic entrepreneur and uh, learned this, the uh, School of Knox from from the world. Well, you haven't stopped making surfboards until recently, from what I can tell. No, that's right. Actually, it's been an incredible journey, and I've got a lot to be thankful for. I've had the most charmed life um, traveling, surfing, shaping surfboards around the world to make money in the early days, um, uh, shaping surfboards for the world's best surfers over about a 30-year period. Um, I founded a company called uh, Nev Future Shapes, NEV. My original surfboards actually a bit of a laugh is that my first surfboard, um, we, we named it Hyman Surfboards, which is probably not a very good name to uh, call a surfboard. <laughs> then, um, then I called it uh, Neville Hyman Surfboards because I've never forgiven my mother, who's 92 and still around, and we have a good laugh about this, but I've never forgiven her for calling me Neville <laughs> because um, as a ginger, I mean, you know, I really had a tough start in life in a housing commission home in Perth in Western Australia name Neville and a ginger. I mean, you can't get more down the rung than that. Um, <laughs> but no, I'm only joking. I had an absolutely charmed uh, uh, life living in Perth in Western Australia. But, um, yeah, so it's, it's really part of my DNA is the fact that I've, I've, um, I've really come from a, a low socioeconomic area, um, had a charmed life, found my passion, never had a real job, and, and because of that, I've had to push and push and ride out the storms, you know, ride the wave, you could say, of life. Well, you started with your first surf company with some buddies, but to grow it to where it is even today, because the company still exists from what I can tell, and you've been with some of the, the biggest names in surfing, you have to tell us a little bit more about how did you grow that first company? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I... We started our first surfboard business called Odyssey Surfboards in Perth, Western Australia. So the start of my Odyssey, and that's the very groovy name with the seagulls and the sun rising out of the ocean, that sort of early 70s period. Um, and then I got to about 1977 and we'd 
been only two and a half years of in business, you know, at a, a ripe old age of 19, and went, hang on a sec, I need to move to Queensland. Uh, I need to be on the east coast of Australia because Perth is back in back then was probably one of the most remote capital cities on the planet. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I moved to to Burley Heads on the Gold Coast, and that just so happened to coincide with one of the most dynamic surfing events called the Stubbies Surfing Event at Burley Heads. Burley Heads is one of the most renowned surfing spots on the planet, the perfect right-hand tube, if you can imagine. And um, I, um, uh, so I started living there, and all of a sudden I started making surfboards for some of the world's best surfers back in the day. Um, we're talking people like Sean Thompson, Ian Cairns, um, Dane Kialoa, people that only if you surf you would know who these people are, but they were the gods of surfing back then. And, and I was a little grommet coming from Western Australia that just hap- so happened to start making boards for these guys. And um, that evolved into my joke before about what I was calling my boards. They were called Neville Hyman surfboards at the time in 1978 to 1980. And I went, ah, it just doesn't have it. Then the 80s hit us. The glorious big hair, <laughs> big bright fluoro 80s. And it allowed me to shorten my name to Nev. Nev's an acronym. Nev, Nev N-E-V, it could mean anything. It doesn't doesn't mean me. It just it's it's just a word. It's a powerful three letter word, and um, so I put a powerful three letter word on the nose of my surfboards, and and it was very visible. Um, it's different now. Everybody wants everything to be small and no no label, no brand. Whereas back in the eighties, it was all about brand, all about logo, and um, so I rode that wave of that period between nineteen eighty and maybe eighty seven, and I and. I travelled shaping surfboards all around the world. I realised that to get a global brand, you had to be out there. Um, so, and it was just an amazing experience to be to fly to Hossegor in France and go surf, you know, and and come back and shape surfboards for for a crew there, and then go to California or go to Japan or and South America. And I, I just had this, you know, I'm not boasting, but I just had this amazing experience. On top of the fact that I love to travel and go surfing, and you're in these beautiful, pristine places like Indonesia back in the late 70s and early 80s and uh, so many different places. And then then test yourself in Hawaii. And I, I, was, I, I had a lot of fun and a lot of connection with the Hawaiian surfers and I made a lot of boards for them too. So all of that happened in that early period in the early 80s. That created my brand. And then, I, then the Nev Future Shapes brand became – one of the top five surfboard brands in the world, alongside of Rusty and Al Merrick and Turner Country and Local Motion and all these well-known global brands. Um, but as a entrepreneur and as an innovator, and I'm saying that humbly, I, you know, I do believe that I do innovate things. I that I realised that I couldn't keep up with the demand for my surfboards, so I instigated the process to turn hand shaping of surfboards into CAD CAM, meaning computer-aided design and mm. computer-aided machining. And whilst that is commonplace now, back in the late 80s, it was, oh, no, you can't do that. Hand-shaping a surfboard is a craft. If you don't hand-shape a surfboard, you take the soul out of the craft. And I, because I was promoting this as the way in which designers of surfboards could have their boards sold all over the world um, and still contain the authenticity of the original design, the original hand-shaped design, that was my holy grail. And I spent the next 10 years developing that process alongside other people around the world, but really I was the first to commercialise that. And then that itself evolved into the next part of my journey, which was Firewire Surfboards. And, um, And Firewire Surfboards now is globally renowned as probably the most innovative surfboard company, most sustainable and environmental uh, surfboard company. And that that birthed in 2005. And in 2015, Kelly Slater purchased the company pretty much. So I'm very proud of that. And I'm no longer involved with Firewire. Okay. Um, I, I love the guys, but I didn't want to continue my role as the head designer for a global company and have to compete with all the other designers. I'd had my day. I had 25, 30 years of traveling the world, being the guy at the surfing contests and shaping surfboards for all the top pro surfers. I didn't really want to do that anymore, as strange as that sounds. And um, so Kelly took it out. And um, um, and now 
I could focus on what I'm doing with Nev House. And I can also now focus on doing my original surfboard brand because the crazy thing is the 80s was a real fun period of time. The surfboards we were riding in the 80s were, worked as well as the surfboards we're riding now. And now you'll see this resurgence. And then people said, look, Nev, we want your boards that you did back in the 80s. So it allowed me to though step back into my happy place, which is my shaping room. So I started the Nev Future Shapes brand again. It started again because people wanted me to hand shape them surfboards. And um, I charged top dollar to make those boards. But then about six months ago, I was approached by a surfboard company that said, Nev, you haven't used this brand for a long time. We are going to reintroduce it to the global market. So I've embraced that. I'm using my CAD CAM technology to be able to copy the boards that I've handshaped. So these new range of old board branded boards are now being released to the market and they're high performance, fun surfboards. And and I'm excited about it. <laughs> it sure sounds like you are. I, I want to go back to something you briefly said about Nev House. Now, in my research, I also noticed that you got into the recycling business along the way. How did you go from surfboard maker to recycler to now involved in what's called Nev House? Yeah, well, that's yeah, the, the, the very interesting segue for me into um, the issue about plastic recycling is this. When I was in New Caledonia or an atoll off New Caledonia in 1992, and um, I noticed a lot of plastic on the beaches and I just went, wow, what's going on here? Has somebody dumped a bunch of plastic in the environment? It's just washed up on the beach here. Uh, you know, I didn't, there was no talk about Pacific gyres and water plastic in the environment, et cetera. So that was in the back of my mind. Um, in 2004, um, I, you know, I've been through some troubling times in my life and, and I was um, looking at things to invest in. To, and I, I saw this opportunity to, to invest in plastic recycling. I thought, oh, well. I'll give that a shot. For about six years, I was a passive investor with that company and nothing was happening. And then um, the person that I invested with actually got cancer, sadly, and passed away. Um, my wife and I decided to invest further into the company and took control of the company. And that was in 2009. And, um, and since then, I've had to make that investment work. So my point being, I didn't set out to become this so-called environmentalist. Um, it was out of anxiety <laughs> is the mother of invention, not not um, not the other term that is used. The, the anxiety around trying to protect my financial interests made me dig deep to find out how I could um, turn this company into something that the world needs. Mm. And um, so that, that's, that's how I got involved. But the interesting thing is that the world has changed. Um, I recently spoke at a, an event in London, um, and it was the global, it was a world Chinese um, uh, global conference for entrepreneurs. And I was invited by Prince Andrew, of all people, because I won that event called Pitchett Palace. And I stood in front of all these Chinese entrepreneurs and, I, and, and uh, leading um, uh, companies in China and said, Xi Xi China, thank you, China. Thank you, China, for putting up the China sword for stopping the West's waste coming to your door because now the West must deal with their own plastic waste. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a turning point in, in January 2018 for the world to recognise that we've got to find a better solution to recycling plastic and we've got to find a, a solution to what we do with that plastic. So that was my segue into where I'm at right now. Well, it's actually... Interesting because, you know, 2004 was a long time ago when mm. recycling wasn't as top of mind for most people. And certainly the China sword has made a dramatic impact to the local market in terms of what can be recycled and, and where it's going now. But you actually started the company that I, I really want to talk about now, which is Nev House. You started mm. that in 2013. So that that's still far enough back um, mm. where people didn't see plastic as a resource necessarily. So why don't you talk a little bit more about how you started that company and why? Yeah, okay. So um, as I said, I invested in this company in 2004. That company was called JET, Julian Environmental Technology. And they took supposedly the seven codes of plastic and using friction, 
uh, made a molasses of that plastic and then pushed into a mould. And that mould made bollards and chipping pallets and wood replacement products. They were ahead of their time. There was no real desire to take plastic and turn it into wood replacement products, even though it was still a great idea. Um, so I was pushing this and I was trying to sell it. And in fact, I sold the rights to this um, technology to a company in Papua New Guinea, a listed company in 2012. And I thought, great, I've put this behind me. I invested in a company, I've sold the rights, I can cash out of it, and I can go back to doing, making surfboards, which is, what my, which is my passion. Um, then that deal fell over, not because of us, but because of some other things that happened in Papua New Guinea, which happens. And that was a $15 million deal, and that would have set us on the road to um, you know, moving forward. So um, after that, I had to figure out how I was going to um, now sell a product that really nobody wants. I mean, people's investors' eyes just glaze over when you say, look, we take plastic out of the environment, they go, oh, wow, that's great, and we turn it into shipping pallets. And they go, really? So? No, nah, not interested. Thanks very much. So there I was sitting in Bali, in Indonesia, with some friends, um, and I was going, hang on a sec, I think I can build this house this, that I can see in, a, um, in a, a, a document in front of me that the Indian, Indonesian government were giving to the poor on Lombok, on an island in Indonesia. I'm sure I can make it out of this. Cut a long story short, I couldn't. I couldn't make it out of the technology that I had invested in. So I had to walk away from that technology and come up with another way. And because surfboards are made like a, a surfboard blank is a mould, it's not an extrusion. So to be technical, the, the, um, the technology from JET was an, an intrusion of material into a mould. Mm -hmm. And other methods of, it, of recycling are extrusion, like wood plastic, um, WPC, wood plastic compost, and other things, yeah. or, or injection moulding and all these other methods. You can't use contaminated plastic or co-mingled plastic to, in, in most of these recycling technologies. I had to come up with a different way, and I found a way which was very much like a surfboard blank. The moulding process allowed me to make anything that I wished to make. So what we did was we then considered we could make housing for the poor from this moulded product. So the journey for that, we changed the name of Jet House. It was actually called Jet House in the beginning. We couldn't use Jet anymore, technically, so we had to come up with a new name. And my son turned around and said, Dad, just call it Nev House. You've had <laughs> Nev surfboards for all these years. You've used your name. You're talking about the environment all the time. Just call it Nev House because I know that you and many other people, if you've ever tried to come up with a new name for anything right now, it's almost next night of impossible because everything's taken. Mm. So I had the trademark. I had everything for Nev House. So, so we called it Nev House in 2013. That was the start of this whole program to then develop the technology. Now, the, the important thing here to remember is that when we started Nev House, the emphasis was on the fact that the world needs housing. That was my push. I did all my pitches to um, groups all around uh, Indonesia, Australia, and South Pacific about the idea that we that that the McKinsey report uh, in, written in 2014 stated that there's a demand for over 250 million homes just for the displaced. So all my pitches was about trying to get people to get emotional about the idea that um, the world needs homes. And my architect, Ken McBride, and I worked on a, a modular housing solution that could be delivered in two days. That was our plan. So in keeping with that plan, that was my emotional tag. That was how I encouraged people to invest in my company, to get involved, to look for solutions. The interesting thing now is that same idea has evolved now into flipping the coin. I don't talk so much about the need for housing. I now talk about the need to clean up our environment mm. because the whole world is talking about the environment now. Everyone is. I've, I've travelled the world a hundred times over. I'm exaggerating, but over the last three <laughs> years, I've met, I, I've met with more presidents and more prime ministers and more billionaires that you could poke a stick at, I'm, and I'm not exaggerating now, and every one of them is searching for this solution that takes volume plastic out of the environment and turns it into something that, that can use that volume. And the volume is housing, yeah. four tonne of plastic waste per 50 square metre net house. 
it does use up a lot of plastic, but certainly in, in my own experience with molds, the bigger the mold, the more expensive it gets. And the kind of investment you're looking at is, is probably millions of dollars just to get the molds made. So when you're talking to people about this, and especially, it, I mean, it, it sounds like, and just confirm with me or not, it sounds like at the very beginning that you were talking about creating these homes for mostly developing countries that really needed it. How did you get investors to say, yeah, I see where my money will go in and back out of this venture when it would take probably a couple million dollars? I'm just running numbers in my own head. You can confirm or deny just to create the molds to make these flat pack pieces. Hmm. That in effect is a very interesting question because I have long suffering shareholders. You know, some of these shareholders invested back in late 2013. And they still haven't seen a return on their investment. Mm. But I recall a, a, a comment made by, I think it was by Steve Jobs, saying it takes 10 years for a startup. It, it, there's a lot of mountains to climb and a lot of valleys to, 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 to get through in building a company like this. What I also want to say is that this is not rocket science. You know, the, the, the technology behind what we're doing is simple. It's proven technology that can be rolled out simply. But what we had to do first was prove um, the architecture we had to do a proof of concept of what of could we design a home that could be built in two or three days and and withstand a category five cyclone a um a, a, an earthquake a flood um could be have zero or virtually zero maintenance um and be impervious to bacteria and all these wonderful things that we claim on our website we've done that we delivered that already so we delivered that in vanuatu now, that was really only stage one of our program because we were using wood plastic composite for the panels. Mm. We won the Good Design Awards in Australia for a panel. We don't make a house out of bricks. There's a lot of confusion about this. There's a couple of companies around the world that take commingled plastic and make bricks set from them and build houses. But the problem with that is that you have to seal that brick. You have to render that brick. Now, that increases the time and the cost of building something it doesn't it's not a it's, i don't believe it's a complete solution mm. our panel is a composite panel it is actually encapsulation so what i mean by encapsulation is everything within is encapsulated by the polymer that's on the surface so we put a four millimeter polymer on the surface that is either a virgin polymer a single recycled polymer or preferably what we're working on at the moment is a bioplastic, which is made from lignin or green algae. Oh. Now, there, that means that there's no, there's no chemicals on that polymer that's on the surface. Therefore, there is no escaping of VOCs or off-gassing. The polymers that are in the centre, this is a really, really important point. If you take a, your yellow bin or you take municipal waste and put it through a material and grind and shred that without it being sorted, and I've done this in our lab in the US, and all of that waste goes into one big bin, and you, we grind and shred it and don't wash it. So it's commingled, contaminated plastic waste. And then do a test. 70 to 80 percent of the plastic that's in that yellow bin that we look at it every day when we're putting our recyclables in there is polyethylene and polypropylene, mm -hmm. which are regarded as the safe plastics. Now, that means in a molding process, we can use those commingled, contaminated plastics with that organic material still in it. And the bottom 20 to 30% are what you could say are the nasties. But there's only a percentage of, of a percentage of nasties in that bottom 20 to 30% mm. of the PVCs and the, and the um, polystyrenes and the other plastics and the, and the dirt and the oil and the, whatever else is in there. So it's so heavily diluted that is the particulate that's actually inside the panel that's protected by the four millimetres on both surfaces with a bioplastic is so low in any nasties that there is no threat to health. So we, we've solved that problem of using commingled plastic, which actually means that we don't have to sort better, we don't have to clean better, and this is the message that I've been trying to tell Australia, tell the municipalities in the US and in Europe and other people I've been talking to, in effect, you could actually remove the amount of bins that you have in your local environment. Have one bin for green waste and one bin for everything else, which goes through a MRF and gets sorted to a point. 
and then gets turned into modular panels for housing, et cetera. We've had uh, Mark Yates from Replus on the show as well. And yes. he does a lot of that work around soft plastic and specifically the, the kind of soft plastic that's coming from Red Cycle that is mm. generally not in the bins because it can't be recycled that way. And right. we were talking about how they used a, a similar process to create the various products that they made there. Yet, mm. um, speaking to some other people in industry, one of the biggest challenges is obviously the weight when you have a, a different kind of core and then... Obviously, you put an envelope around it to, to protect it and to provide a certain appearance. It just makes it really, really heavy. Now, I'm looking at your mm -hmm. website right now, and these houses are beautiful. It's not the mm -hmm. typical recycled plastic type um, material that you would typically think of. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, because you're, you're having to ship these all over the place, you, you obviously have to make them functionally. Some of the pieces have to move, like the, um, the slats that let air in to the house, you can't follow that same process, I would think, that, that Mark might use for, a, say, a picnic bench. No, I, you know, I've got the greatest respect for Replace. I, I understand exactly what they do, and they, what they do is very similar to my original technology, which was intrusion of a um, friction-based process for um, making a product. And it is heavy, no doubt. Our process is not anywhere near as heavy as that. In fact, we can control the weight by the size of the particulate that goes into it. And because what we do, this is a really important point, I'm not giving away any secrets here, but um, the, the process in the moulding process, we use a firming agent and we use one of the polymers to melt, LDPE. Not all of our plastic melts. So, um, so every other element, every other particulate that's inside becomes a filler. So if we have PET or, or HDPE or, or whatever we have, what other, or ABS or whatever, that becomes a filler as much as a piece of coconut would become a filler or a piece of or fly ash or anything else. It becomes a filler. So the, the, the process is simple. It's proven. It's not heavy. And it's safe. It, it's incredible to see what people can do with mixed plastic. And it's great to know that you can have these alternative solutions the way that you're doing it in a, in a very different way of doing it, but still being able to use commingled consumer waste, which I know is much more readily available in these countries you want to work in. And it's not just commingled consumer waste. This is the other point, is that first of all, I want to say, we all must be looking to repurpose by redesign. We all must be, when I say we all, individuals and government and everything in between, must be looking to repurpose by the re redesign in volume, not boutique solutions, not making things that we don't need enough of. So, you know, now with that in mind, we have to look beyond PET and HDPE as the only things we can really recycle and clean streams of that. So what's the other big volume solutions that we hear about? Um, Turning plastic back into oil mm -hmm. or, you know, do we need more oil? No, I would argue no. Especially when it's a negative price right now. <laughs> exactly. You know, should we incinerate it? Please, various gods, don't allow that to happen. We should not be incinerating plastic for any reason. You know, turning it into road base, for me, the jury is out on that. I'm not the expert in the field. Mm. It's, it's probably the next best solution. There is no question the best solution for use of commingle contaminated plastic waste and the reason I keep harping on that point is that is where the volume is the, the best use of that is in construction in housing mm. and if you can make it safe and uh, and aesthetically pleasing we can make the surface any color and any texture so you won't even know you're living in I'm not I don't even want to say this in a plastic house it's a composite house we are not restricted in, in what we can use now what you alluded to before about you know, you know investors and and, um, and and the journey and what we've delivered and things like that, we are now at the cusp of something super exciting. I'm excited about it and sad about it to be, and I'll explain why. I've been pushing this in Australia now for quite a number of years. In the last two years, heavily, the company's won all sorts of awards. I've won a lot of awards. Um, you know, I, I've done a lot of interviews on. You know, that people know about Newhouse now. The problem is. People in this environment don't want to take a punt. 
You know, the punt that they need to take is that we need to build a plant in Australia to start producing these panels, start taking waste out of the environment, building homes for Indigenous communities in Australia, which we we started a company called Nev Ganya, and we, we've spoken with all the elders. We've got the Indigenous people who work with our company. We want to make a difference in Australia. We want to make a difference about homelessness. We want to, you know, aged care, millennial youth housing, all these things. We want to do that, but nothing's happening. Mm. Whilst I'm saying, you know, take a punt, invest and, um, in, in an impact scenario, this is a very profitable venture to invest in. I'm not suggesting to invest in the parent company. I mean, I'm suggesting invest in a plant. It's very profitable. Uh, if you look at the numbers, it's, it's actually ridiculous um, how, how, how beneficial this will be, will be uh, to the investor if, they, um, you know, if, if a local municipality or government, this is a solution that they have to spend public money on. But if they want to, they can do it at cost and bring housing down significantly. You know, I'm being offered $50 to $150 a tonne take plastic waste in Australia and offered to pay at least $50 a tonne in the US to take plastic waste, the same waste that I would have had to have paid three to $500 a tonne for five years ago. To buy. To buy. Yeah. So this is why it's profitable. And that's not going to change. Plastic's not going to get valuable again. It's just not going to because we've lost China. And especially with the, the plastic um, container schemes you have in place right now, for most of the most desirable plastics, you can sort through that way. So what's left over doesn't necessarily have to be sorted if they're going to do what you've suggested. Mm. And, and I can understand why investors, when they really look at the numbers and see the social good at the same time, all they need is is probably a couple of customers to say, yeah, we're going to build these um, temporary homes or maybe permanent homes for uh maybe an impoverished neighbourhood that needs them. Mm. And mm. if they're going to build them anyways, and they could do it for a lot cheaper, yet there's a profit in it for you, I could see where yeah. there's a lot of value for an investor. Well, our, our Achilles heel is we don't have a plant. That's the Achilles heel. Yeah. Now, the first plant could have been built in Queensland or in, you know, I mean, I've been speaking with the New South Wales government. Now, sadly, I'm almost certain now that the first facility will be in somewhere like, like Knoxville, Tennessee, or Denton and Dallas, or LA, that's where the first one's going to be. What an incredible opportunity missed by Australia. I was in the US last year. I came across an Opportunity Zone fund, and the US administration has instigated a process whereby high net worths who are sitting on significant capital gains can sell down their um, investments, and we've just seen that happen with the stock market crash, and if they reinvest that money into an opportunity zone fund within 180 days and hold it for a matter of years, but if they hold it for 10 years, they will get 100% write-off of their capital gains that they made and will make over that 10-year period. We've established the fund. It's called the Nev Earth Oz Fund, as in Oz Opportunity Zone Fund. Mm. And we are in the process of raising the capital, $350 million US dollars, to, um, through a separate company to NevHouse. It's through a partnership that we've established in the US. And the use of those funds are so that we will build our facilities in depressed areas of the US, create jobs, build master plan communities of housing for the homeless, for the aged care, for everything all the way up to eco resorts, and even build surf resorts in the middle of Wisconsin, mm. surf lakes, which is another thing that I'm doing. So what I'm, what I'm saying behind that is I know that I'm going to get the support in the US to do what we need to do in Australia. I've got a group in the UK that want to do this in the UK. I've got a group in South Africa that want to, do, want to build our facilities. But have I got people knocking on my door in Australia? Sadly, no. Well, so things could change with the COVID-19 crisis and jobs definitely in need yeah. right now. These types of programs um, are, are basically tax advantages for corporations. Do we have anything like that in Australia that would provide those similar kinds of incentives? Not that I'm aware of. I personally think, and others think, this is genius. This is genius by the US to take unrealized capital gains, sitting there doing nothing, $6 trillion worth in the US. Over $600 billion has been taken out of the US stock market. And it's sitting in ultra high net worth accounts or institutions accounts, and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. What's the best thing you could do with that money? 
Now, the investor's not going to give it away. He's going to want to see a good return. Mm. And that return is um, complemented. So if they invest in a company that's going to give them a financial return on that money over a period of time, they will also get the equivalent financial return by the fact that they have not had to pay the capital gains. Right. It is just genius. And so who's actually buying these houses in these countries? The focus of NEP House has always been about affordable, low-cost housing. And our, my goal back in um, 2012 when I sat and saw that house and realised that the government of Indonesia provide these homes for the poor, and I found out that it cost them. And I went with Governor Pastika of Bali to his home village, northeast Bali, showed me what they give the poor that are on the list of housing. So not the ultra poor, but the people that are on the, the housing list. Uh-huh. And it cost the, the Indonesian government between three and 4000 US dollars for 25 square metres, concrete slab, tinder brick wall, wooden frame, uh, tiled roof, not rendered, kitchen sink out of concrete, toilet out of concrete, that's it, three to $4,000. So that was my benchmark. And, Mr. and Governor Pastika said to me, Mr. Hyman, if you can build a house that's better than this, or say five thousand US dollars, we'll buy a million houses a year from you. And I went, I, I laughed, of course. But mm-hmm. they do have a million house a year program in in Indonesia, mm-hmm. and they're, they're achieving it to a point. So our focus has been on that. But if you just consider this, if we if we need four ton of plastic waste to build all the panels, floor, wall, and roof of one of our homes, so we're talking about a really basic scenario, a single skim home, um, that's going to cost us. In fact, in some cases, it's not going to cost us anything. We're going to be paid to make, it, make those panels because the material we use, is we're being paid to take. Even if we had to pay $100 a tonne or $200 a tonne, we would still only be paying less than $1,000 for the materials, no, you know, for the panels, not just the materials, for the panels of the house. Mm. The, the other element are the footings and the frame of the house. The frame at the moment is made from laminated veneer lumber. That's the most expensive part. But we're working with the group in Indonesia that is going to make the frame out of composite bamboo. Mm. So there's, whole, there's a whole incredible discussion about that um, with the Thousand Bamboo Village Program in Indonesia where they're growing bamboo to, to reforest um, the forests and they're uh, using the bamboo, but bamboo just by itself is not that great. You know, it's, but when you make a composite from it, it's incredible. It's stronger than steel. So what we're doing is we're bringing the price down of the house down to try and achieve that goal, that 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 target of, of say five thousand dollars US. Now, if we can build a fifty square meter house for five thousand dollars US and make a profit for our investors, then guess what? If we build a fifty square meter house for uh, an eco resort, we could charge fifty thousand dollars for it. Yeah, yeah. You know, or twenty thousand dollars for it. So the margin goes through the roof. It just depends on who we want to sell it to. Mm. The house remains the same. So it's an incredibly profitable scenario we're heading into. That makes so much sense. In fact, we've had other guests on the, on this show that have talked about if you actually close the loop and you take out the waste management cost of government and you consider mm. that it's part of the equation, that mm. there is huge value in closing the loop and creating a something on the other end that they wouldn't otherwise buy from somebody else. Instead, they're using their own material resources that would normally be in the tip somewhere. So I I think that what you're talking about right here makes a huge amount of sense from an investment point of view. The second stage of what we're doing is building our facilities that will will actually take the commingled plastic out of the local environment. So I've hit on a really important point, which is our business plan is to build locally everywhere globally. Because we can, we can build a small facility that costs a couple of million dollars. It'll take 2,000 tonne of plastic waste out of that local community and build 300 homes, 50 square metre homes or 500 square metre homes. Yeah. We can build a, a facility that will do 2,000 homes of the same size and take 8,000 tonne of plastic waste out of the local community. Or we can build a facility that does 10,000 homes a year. And when I say homes, it can be homes, it can be community centres, it can be medical clinics. I've, I've met in Geneva at the UN about doing a thousand Nev houses in a warehouse, strategically placed all around the world, waiting for the next disaster or the next refugee crisis. Mm. Those thousand homes can be deployed in a week or two. Permanent, beautiful homes that give people dignity in the face of a crisis. And then, if necessary, those homes can be dismantled 
with no environmental impact, no concrete, no nothing, put back into the warehouse for the next problem. So there's so many iterations of a rapidly deployed, demountable, flat pack home. These don't come on the back of a truck, as in a finished home on the back of the truck with a crane, like a, like a donger. Uh-huh. These come flat pack. We built a house on the beach at Noosa. We built it in one day and took it down in five hours. And it was up for nine days during the Noosa Surfing Festival in 2019. Wow. 18, sorry. So there's so many iterations, it's ridiculous. I think locally, especially where I'm at, we just can't forget that we just went through the bushfires. Yeah. And there's an lot, awful lot of people that lost their homes in that. And some of them are living in Airbnb places right now or with family members. And, and those types of portable, quick developing type houses that are so easy to put together just sounds like they're perfect for these types of disasters where it might take a lot longer just to get the insurance money before they can move back in. Absolutely. I saw something the other day about these poor people down on the South Coast, and they were so excited that they just had a delivery of a container, a 20-foot container that's been fitted out and funded by Mindaroo Foundation, Twiggy Forrester's Foundation, which is, I'm not, this is not a criticism. This is a pat on the back. This is an awesome solution for these people. It comes with a toilet and a kitchen and everything's fitted out and it just comes on the back of a truck and craned into place. And these people, these poor people that have lost everything, are so happy that they've got this. Now, I just want to add a different scenario to that. What about instead of a containerized finished home, what about if a home arrives on the back of a flatbed truck and it's got a kitchen and bathroom also on the back of that truck and that home can be built by the people in one to two days themselves with a foreman and when they finished it is a home that they would be excited about living in and proud because it's groovy it's gorgeous it looks like an eco studio sitting on you know it's it's meant to be not a container who wants to live in a container yeah you know that's why the container solution has never really worked there's millions of containers all over the world but you know you've got to chuck an air conditioner into it you've got to cut windows through the walls you know, oh Whereas, look at my website and look at those homes, like you said before, they're gorgeous. Now, that design can change to look like anything. It can look like a, a home that was, is being built uh, um, in Mexico, for example, a flat roof, you know, rendered walls. It doesn't have to look like what you see in that picture. It's all about a module, a three-meter module, and then architecture comes second. I'm just fascinated by everything here. Now, if, if people want to reach out and contact you, what, what's the best way to do that? Well, probably just go straight to um, our website and, and um, I'm happy, you know, my, my email is simply nev.hyman at nevhouse.com or Google my name, you'll see it'll come up. There's a whole bunch of really funny stories about the world's biggest surfboard and, so, you know, if you want to have a good laugh, Google, Google my name. It's quite it's <laughs> funny. Some, some really silly things that I've done in the past. But no, that's probably the best way to get hold of, of me and, um, and I'd love to talk to anybody that has a solution. Well, I certainly had a good laugh when I saw your Guinness World Record, so that, that was quite funny. <laughs> Nev, it's been just great to talk to you. You've had such a fascinating career in starting with surfboard making, something you're still continuing today. It's really fun to see how much passion you have in everything you do and how you inadvertently got involved in a, a recycling company that turned into a massive investment for you and your family. And now you've driven that for the last few years to try to actually do something amazing with plastic waste that can't be used in many other ways. So it's been just great to talk to you. And I really want to wish you um, good luck with this venture. And hopefully in a couple of years time, we're going to be able to see a bunch of Nev houses all over the world, especially in places that have just experienced national disasters, just like here in Australia recently, that can have affordable, great looking houses that people want to live in in a very short time after such things happen. So good luck with that. And thank you so much. Well, thanks, Tammy. And, you know, this is a plastic revolution. And we do need to take it seriously. And we do need to look for the bigger solutions. Definitely. So I'm excited. Thank you so much for the opportunity to to speak to your your, uh, listeners. Oh, it's my pleasure. Cheers, Nev. 
Thanks for joining me today on this podcast. If you want to see the links or to review any information we spoke about today, then check out our show notes on this channel or on our website, plasticsrevolution.com. If you found anything interesting or helpful at all, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to our show and to tell others. Stay tuned next week as I chat to another innovator, change maker, or fellow entrepreneur who is leading the plastics revolution. This is Tammy Vendange. Be kind to animals and Mother Nature. <laughs>